and welcome back to the book and life podcast today we are going to have a brand new book guest on whether they're an author an editor a producer you'll never quite know so you're in for one hell of a ride but today i just have to uh do the adverts and then i'll get us straight into that most important conversation and as as we do every week um i'm going to read the shadow which is part of the Time Guardian series, and this is book four from Marianne Curley. The battle is over, the war is won. A prophecy complete, but life can't just pick up where it left off for even, struggling to cope with tragic loss, at odds with friends in the guard. He finds himself adrift, jumping in shadows and sensing someone who can't possibly be there. Blaming herself for the goddess Athena's death, Giselle swears revenge to fullify the immortal's plan for world domination, but Giselle hadn't planned on love, and that leaves her with an unbearable choice. Should she follow her heart or the strings of a goddess short on praise but high on expectation, who continues to pull her from the grave? As the guard and the order battles through the past and into an impossible future, darkness looks round every corner. The fight for the world's survival rests with just one. Is it friend or foe who stands in the shadow? And just a reminder that The Price of Freedom by Rosemary Aiken, sorry, Rosemary Rowan, um, is being donated to the Ukraine refugee crisis. And here's the blurb for her book. It's uh, one of her... Roman British crime series, which was written under her maiden name. All editions can be found online where all books are sold, even her agents donating her commission. Sorry, I don't have the blurb for that, but uh, that's that's what she's doing. And now, without further ado, let's get you to the guests. Well, guys, I promised you a phenomenal guest, and I could not have found anyone better than this gentleman that's coming on. He's super talented. He's also a fellow proud scop, and uh, you know, we're getting there. We're all seeping into the industries everywhere and uh, leading the charge, so to speak. So without further ado, everyone, please welcome Denzel. I hope to pray I got that right. Well, I'm a Denzel with an I rather than an E, but it's like you're all right. <laughs> that was close. You're close. Yeah. <laughs> It's all right. Half the time, people can't get mine either. So I was like, <laughs> people never get my name right. Trust me. <laughs> oh, I at least try though. I I do. I go it out of my a, way to. It try. was a fair attempt. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your current piece of work, and you know, what was what was behind it that inspired it? Margaret Holly House is a departure for me because, as you know, I I'm more familiar from writing the DCI Daily series set in. Kintyre. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to write something different and to move away from the Kintyre setting. And so I thought that, you know, and also change the style. So Murder at Holly House is first person. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting as well to do. It's a very different process when you're writing about, as you know. Um, and so I wanted to try that. I wanted to write something that was a, a bit nostalgic at being a Christmas book. And setting it in this country, setting it back in the 50s is a really you know, good thing to do because whether it was nostalgic or not at the time, um, people perceived the 50s to be a very happy and simpler time, which yeah. it most certainly was. Yeah. Uh, didn't have all the pressures of um, the World Wide Web and social media and everything else that goes along with it. Uh, so I wanted to, to do that. And Murder at Holly House was the result. Mm-hmm. And I'm really pleased with it because it's, very different, very different um, when when compared to daily, but it also has the humour and the kind of compelling nature that the daily novels have as well. So that's my my aims have been achieved to date. So when when was that kind of almost aha moment for you when it came to this one? Was there like a moment where you're like, I know how I'm going to do this. This this is this is clear in my head. This is how I'm going to go for it. Yeah, that, that's. 
I think you get to a point when you're just about to write a book that you always have that kind of, oh, I'm not much of a plotter or a planner. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I usually have the thread of the story in my mind mm -hmm. uh, before I sit down at the, the computer, but I don't have post-it notes over the walls or, you know, um, I don't have reams and reams of notes. I had to do some historical research for this this one. Yeah. And I was ha I was helped greatly by the Thursk Police Museum in, in North mm -hmm. Yorkshire, who were a great help. Um, and I think the moment you, when you, for me, the aha moment is when you put the, you know, well, I say pen to page as a. Yeah, you know, that's a classic one for us Scots is pen to page. We don't really do the whole blank page thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not totally Scottish. I hate to disappoint you, but. No, you I know. Mind. I'll uh, cling on I'm, to that little bit, though. Champion uh, it anyway. Absolutely, and um, yeah. So I, I, when you when you take the first few words of the of the the manuscript, and you look at you maybe write three or four pages, and then you look back at it, and then you think, well, this is going to work. And that's when I, because Grasby was a totally new character, and yeah, and as I say, very different um, compared to Jim Daly. So. When you were thinking of sort of moving into other areas of writing, was there a process for you, or was there um, just to kind of let's see where it takes kind of feeling? When I first started writing, yeah, um, yeah, I think I first started writing when I was I was ill back in twenty ten, mm -hmm. and I've been ill for a while, and I. I wasn't able to work, you know, normally because I was, it was just too unwell. Yeah. And I'd always thought of writing a book. And I thought, well, you've got a lot of time in your hands now. Now's the time. And I did it purely as an exercise. It was just really an exercise in, in just to see if I could do it or not. Because I, I think when most people embark upon writing a book, they don't consider, you know, the, the whole breadth of it and how long it's going to take and how difficult it's going to be and how, you know, you, this is going to take up a large portion of your life and you have to be so disciplined into writing every day and doing what you should do. Um, so I thought, well, it's interesting to see if I can I can do that. And that's when, that's why I started writing, really. Mm -hmm. Though I'd written a lot before for in business and for as a freelance journalist and things like that. So, I mean, it's not as though I was new to writing, but I was certainly new to writing novels. And yeah. that, that for me, was a very interesting process. So it, I didn't have any any um, restrictions in terms of time or, or deadlines or anything like that. And it was just a case of writing it and seeing how good I could get it and then sending it out to publishers and agents. And I didn't really have any expectations that, you know, you hear all the apocryphal stories about 2% of people who write books are ever taken aboard by a publisher or agent. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see how the process worked and played the string out. And that's, and it was published very quickly. I think I sent the book out in, in late April and I had a firm publishing offer in the beginning of June. Wow. So that, that was good as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also the process is sometimes it can take a long time to get going. And then there's obviously ones where you just sort of jump in and it just takes off. For me, I went the indie route um, because I've got severe dyslexia. So it took me a while to find that kind of way forward for myself. What's, what are you excited about doing as you're moving forward with your writing? What's, what's getting you excited about the future? Money. <laughs> At least that's no. an honest answer. <laughs> no, it's always interesting to to explore new. It's like Star Trek. Yeah. To explore strange new world. It's interesting to explore new characters. It's all and and to explore new markets. Yeah. You know, because when your books are are bought in many places around the world, that's that's exciting and interesting. Yeah. It's just a it's just a great business to be in because you know it's such you have such freedom and you have such. Um, you know, it's not like any other job. You don't, no. you don't write, and and it preys in your mind nearly all the time. 
So you, you'll be the same, Crystal. When you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about what you're going to write and when you're going to write it and how yep. many words you're going to write and and try and fit it in with all the rest of the things that you have to do. And, and the more successful you become, the more things, other things, ancillary things you end up having to do. Yeah, that's very true. And that can be difficult as well, can't it? So yep. you always have to think, you know, p- plan very carefully. But, but it's such an, an exciting job. It's not going out into the North Sea to catch fish. It's not going down a pit. It's not, it's, you're not a soldier. Mm-hmm. You're not a doctor on, a, on the front line or a nurse. It's, in that respect, it's a very easy job. Um, yeah. And I would say that's, you know, where, the way I see it. Um, yep. to be very, you're privileged to be able to make a living from this. This kind yeah, of you are. You, you really are. And I think growing up in the North Sea and seeing the fishermen coming in and seeing how tough they have it, you know, it does it did make me very much appreciate the fact that I could sit in my very comfy, warm armchair and in my very comfy, warm house. And, you know, that was me at work. And, Absolutely. And, you know, at I, the I end mean, of the day, go I, to bed, I, you know. I grew up by the sea as well. And yeah. Cam in Campbelltown, and the guys didn't go into the North Sea, but they went into the Atlantic, you know. And yep. and a lot of them, <clears throat> some of them died. Friends of mine died, um, in some terrible tragedies. The Antares, uh, when the Antares fishing boat was was pulled under by a submarine, and um, I lost friends that day. Billy Martindale had been at school with me and was a lovely bloke, and it was really strange enough because we went long. We weren't that old. I think I was in my early twenties when that happened, and he would be as well. And yeah. just remembered back to all the good times at school and all that. So, I know when I sit here and write a book, I'm not at risk of well, unless from natural causes, I'm mm-hmm. not at risk of any of any any catastrophe. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I grew up with the, the player rig going down, which was the the very famous yeah. uh, oil tanker. And I grew up with. At a time when fishing was exceedingly dangerous in the North Sea because oh, yeah. boys, you know, they didn't have the funding, they didn't have the support and now it seems that they're under attack from French fishing boats which is the, the latest thing <laughs> um, yeah. but you know, it, and I always appreciate that and I think also grow, you know, being a part of Scotland and growing up in Scotland, the magic of that country and the, the gift, I think it gives all of us our own version of storytelling. Because if you're working on the fishing boats, you're guaranteed they're telling stories because they got to pass the time somehow because the work is monotonous. And, you know, it was the same when we worked in the bars, you know. Telling sure. stories was always was a huge, huge thing for me. Um, but I love now being able to go to all these other Scottish towns and all these English towns and sit in the library and hear other people's excitement for the written word and to see sure. it's still there, it's still burning away after all these hundreds of years and and now oh. we're fighting, you know, social media and T V and, and all yeah. this instant gratification too. Um and I, sure. I, I that gets me excited in the morning for getting up and writing something is knowing that somebody's gonna find that more entertaining than sitting and looking at Instagram or Facebook or whatever for hours yeah. a day you know and whether it's writing for the screen or writing for <clears throat> books and publishing mm-hmm. or you know it all boils down to the same intrinsic human need to tell tales which has been going on since beginning of time beginning of time and when we when at the beginning of our time we can sit around fires and and tell tales and and relate stories and, and no matter how complicated that becomes in its telling uh, the way of telling, the method, mm-hmm. in the in, the internet or on in film or television, whatever it is, it will never be any more complicated, really, than somebody making up a story and yep. writing it down or telling it or anything else. The writing has to come before anything else can work. And exactly. that's, you know, I think that's something that, that people might, we have, we have the challenge of AI now, of course. Yes, of course, yes. Funny yeah, games. And, well, my, mine are one of the books that were sampled illegally to train AI. AI. Oh, um, wow. Society, yeah, the Society of Writers or um, in, a, in America um, provided a search engine where you could search to see if your books were amongst those that were used for this AI training without mm-hmm. permission or payment. 
And yeah. I'm afraid to say that mine were. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's when, when it's your thing and it's your living, um, it becomes very personal at that point because these people are depriving me of my income. Yeah. And then what are they going to do afterwards with that, that knowledge? Of that course, been? yeah. So I'll be interested to see how that all plays out, though I don't have the the same um, catastrophe theory that, that many have. I, I think mm-hmm. that... I don't think that AI will ever be able to put in the nuances that a, you know a writer can can his or herself, yeah, their self. And I, and I feel that you know it's it's a problem for the industry. But then again, the industry has faced problems since its inception, so it'll be yeah. another thing that we have to, to endure and get over. Yeah, because I mean plagiarism and and all that stuff has existed since the crack of dawn, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, you know, so it's not it's not like it's a a huge new territory for us, but I think it is incredibly awful that we're now having to worry about can a computer try and take what I've done and replicate something different or keep a mm. series going after my death and my family doesn't get to you know be the ones to decide if that happens or not. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. That is that is a difficulty. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when you think of. But, Amazon recently said, okay, we're limiting um, writers to three books a week, publishing them. And you kind of think, well, you must smell, smell something fishy there if somebody's publishing three books a week. You know, yeah. because it's, it's a difficult one. But nonetheless, they struggle on. So what are you currently, like, is there a book that you're reading right now or that you've come across that would say has made you excited? I've, yeah, I've read a few books that I've really enjoyed lately. Um, the new one by S.G. McLean, The Winter List, I think it's called, is a fabulous book. And it's a perfect book for this season as well. It's set in winter time and shown as a wonderful writer. Mm-hmm. And I thought our previous, our last book, um, the book Seller of Inverness, was was one of our it best. Was phenomenal, yeah. Phenomenal book, and she's a wonderful person and a really, really good writer. And um, so I really like her. Her and David Grant's um, Wager is another book that I've enjoyed recently. It's not yeah. it's fiction. It's you know let's like dramatize fiction because really he he like with um, the Flower and Moon that's so popular at the moment because of the film. Um, he reconstructs the past. Through dramatization, through through fictionalizing it in a book, and it was so well done, and I really thought that was one of my the best books I've read recently. Yeah, um, I tend not to read a lot of crime fiction. No, um, because, because a it's a bit like a busman's holiday if you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, it day. is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and and b you're always worried in case subconsciously you pick something up. Yeah, you know. Um, and I know writers that have done that subconsciously and thought, oh no, and they finished the book and realised that a lot of the premise has been predicated upon something that they they read or, or saw and thought, oh, so it's, you know, so I don't want that to happen. But it's nice to read, you know, you know it's nice to have a full reading schedule. I'm also reading Craig Brown's, um, two th- uh, what is it called, 234 or 1234. Is yeah. the, which is his massive biography of the Beatles, yeah, and it's just it's a he it doesn't have it in any kind of order, so mm-hmm. it's like a stream of consci- consciousness about the Beatles, all different aspects of the band and the times and the individuals and the music, and it's really really good. So if anybody, any anyone has a chance to read that, I recommend that they do if they're a Beatles fan. Yeah, I, I will definitely be giving that to my sister in law. She absolutely adores them for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, it's great. So for for you, what's what is your readers able to look forward to? Is there anything in particular that you you really want them to look out for? Well, obviously, Murder at Holly House, which yep. has been uh, is out on the ninth of November um, in in hardback ebook, uh, audiobook, and a special Waterson's edition, yes. an exclusive yeah. limited edition of the book too. Um. Um, but my previous book that was published in the summer, uh, No Sweet Sorrow, the twelfth, the eleventh DCI daily novel, has just been. Um, we found out that's one of Watson's books of the year, which wow. I'm pleased to know. Um, 
Um, so yeah, but look forward and look back in the summer of next year. I've got a really exciting project coming up with Transworld Books. The it's called the Estate, yeah. and it's about a hyper rich family who, um, who who come across hard times when the 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 Zion of the family, the the, the main man, dies live on television. Oh wow! And the book develops from there, and it's a bit of a thriller and as my I was speaking to my editor about it last weekend and Finn Cotton and he was he was saying, you know, this book just has just about everything in it. And it's yeah. so good. So it's got something, you know I I always think I write thrillers more than I do police procedurals or anything yeah, like that. Of course. And I thought the daily books were thrillers or are thrillers as well. Mm-hmm. Um so I will always look forward to bringing something new. We've got that coming in the summer of the estate coming the summer of 2024 and another Grasby coming in ready for Christmas next year and then a daily coming in the summer of 2025 so it's all planned out and it's very busy so I'm in the process of, of writing these books now um though the the estate is is written and yeah um and so is obviously the one that's coming out on the 9th of November murder at Holly House so yeah there's quite a lot to look forward to in terms of stuff in the future that's a good thing because i think readers nowadays we're we're so hungry and we're always looking Mm -hmm. and sometimes i always say to say to my partner well even though i've got 700 books they're all adored they're all going to get read eventually and you know that's that's the best life to have is is to to have that and to to be excited and to to follow it see what's going what's going to come of it yeah. So what would be your ideal achievement in the next sort of stage of your writing career and in your career itself? What's what's your biggest goal you want to achieve? I, I've been very fortunate in my writing journey, Crystal, because you know, I I, I had success very quickly and that was mm-hmm. that was really good. Whiskey from Small Glasses, which was the first daily novel. Yeah. It sold really, really well. It was Watch the Scottish Book of the Year at the time and, and um I was delighted with the way things went on, but it's always nice to to progress. And the more people that buy your books, the more excited and interested you become. Because yeah, it's, all, it's always good to know that what you're doing is being appreciated um, widely. And so, to continue having success would be great. Um, to break new ba- new markets would would also be great. I mean, America is a very difficult market to. It is, yeah. To break. Yep. I'd love to have success there. Um, I'm also involved in the the uh, adaptation of the daily novels of television mm-hmm. adaptation, which I can't say too much about, but it's ongoing. Yep, but there's and a lot of fun to that. Yep. Uh, well, it's a lot. It's very exciting, really, is. But it's had a lot of hard work, as you know. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all these things, and just to be able to get going and uh, outside writing, I'd like the world to be a better place. I must be honest; at the moment, it's not. No, it's not. No, I'll agree with you on that one. And and um, you know, I think that kind of feeds into everything people do. If it's not the crisis, the, the financial crisis that is ongoing for people, it's what's happening in Ukraine. It's what's happening in the Middle East. Yep. And all these things, you know, I think affect trends in writing as well. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Because when after COVID, there was mm-hmm. a distinct trend to less visceral novels buying you know buying those kind of books and then to the more cozy side of the market yeah. because people wanted to be reassured and entertained and because the covid Escape. Yeah, yeah it was just absolutely pure escapism um and i think we always have to keep an eye on, on what's what's current no matter how dreadful yeah, it is yeah it it's, it's dreadful at the moment yeah. and i know that from from working sort of in the contemporary fiction elements of it that i noticed like you know, I was trying to go into YA and I was trying to go into dystopian and then I was like, oh, I can't do that yeah. because now we've got COVID and nobody wants to pick that up. No, nobody, no publisher's going to pick this up because they're living it and we're all living it. So for me, yep. it, it was a case of readjusting and, and just keeping on with the series that I had and, mm. and letting mm. those characters dictate where I was going with things. Um, yeah, but yeah, keeping idea. on top of it, yeah. It's, it's, mm. it's a lot. A lot of writers 
picked up on COVID and used it in their books. Yeah. And I didn't. No, because, I didn't either. Yeah, because I figured that everyone had had enough of, you know, had really yeah. had enough of it. And they didn't want to read all about it again in a book that was never going to recreate how dreadful it was going yeah. through, which everyone did. So, yeah, that was an interesting, but okay, personal choice. But the, the the ironic thing was, of course, during the pandemic, books about pandemics sold like never before. Mm -hmm. So that was a strange one as well. Um, you know, I think that Peter May had a book that he'd, he'd written three or four years, which was an cannily similar similar to what really happened yeah and it sold hugely through through covid so yeah i just took that particular decision because i i, I wouldn't have wanted to read a book no. with COVID, you know that was containing all the horrors of covid but i you know it's it's very subjective it's horses for courses yeah it is and i think certain things needs to be done at certain times as well and I yeah. think when a lot of us were doing our own kind of ventures into other areas, it was just some of us got hit at the wrong points and some of us got hit at the right points. Absolutely. So, yeah, and I think that's that's a life lesson as a writer. Just not only be aware of what's currently going on so that you can kind of keep up with that, but also on the flip side, be mm -hmm. aware that timing is, is, is part of this gig. It's, it's part of understanding what maybe needs to be worked on more in that specific point in time and what should maybe be held back for a different time when things aren't maybe so explosive or, or being yeah. developed too highly, you know. I think what's the, the old motto, um, it's a Chinese one, I think, may you live in interesting times. Yeah. And I think we all live in very interesting times, but not in the way probably we'd want them to be. Um, and I don't, you know, I think that humanity in general faces an existential crisis with climate and and what's happening to the planet mm -hmm. and uh you know we, we we're all sleepwalking into this and it's just horrendous yeah, and our, our politicians clearly are up to the job of addressing it yep. clearly globally yeah and no, ma no matter what your political orientation is they're just not mm -hmm. um and that's a real concern for maybe not for my generation maybe for yours Maybe, you know, Definitely because, for mine. Yep. yeah, I mean, I think that the, when I was young, we all thought, you know, the world would, would last forever. The first thing, you know, we heard about this was acid rain away back in the late 80s, you know. And, yeah. And everyone should have realized that you couldn't go on poisoning the place and just get away with it and everyone would be okay. Yep. Um, but here we are now all this time later and we're right on the precipices. It's, of disaster, yeah. It's scary. It's really scary. Yeah. And I think in in some regards, I think the ones that are following on behind us are looking at us like we probably looked back in the day and the ones in front of us and thought, God, they made a mess and now we've got to clean it up. And I yeah. think they're they're thinking the same thing about us now, you know, in, in that kind of yeah, absolutely. bizarre take on things. It's no coincidence that young people are much more involved generally than than older people in in this and yeah. concerned, but but it's a it's a facet of humanity, isn't it? Because we live our lives, all of us live our lives, knowing there's going to be an end to that. Yeah, and I think this fatalism has bred a kind of, you know, a shrug of the shoulders, complacency, because we're going to die anyway. Um, but we we have to understand what we're doing to the future and what we're doing everywhere else and it's really really concerning but you know we just that's what, one of the great things about books it kind of takes you out of all that and, and yeah. you can read and escapism and immerse yourself in something else for a for a while and, and that's really really worthwhile i would agree definitely so how because i know my work and life balance is dreadful how are you doing with yours and the uh <clears throat> steps that you're taking to try and live a much more balanced life um i'm doing my best but uh, you know it's all encompassing at the moment it really really is yep. because at the moment i'm the same boat as you yep yeah I'm, I'm promoting one book i'm editing another and i'm writing another mm -hmm. and i'm also involved with the the show yeah. and all the stuff that goes on in between like the social media and all all you know the emails and running a business because you know you're running a business as well as everything else 
Yeah, you um, are. Yeah. So it, it's it's pretty full on at the moment, and um, yeah, I never really got to take a break in the summer, though I intended to, but mm -hmm. I will be taking a break soon, hopefully. Um, but yeah, you just but the work has to be done, and you've just got to get on with it. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, you, there's no point sitting moaning and, and crying about it or greeting, as we say in Scotland, mm -hmm. about it because you know you're in a very privileged position in the first place to be doing this, and yeah, so exactly. uh, to make a living this way is much easier than most people have, as we've said. So, yeah, but but it's very hard to strike a balance when things are so full on. Um, it and, is. It is. Yeah. And it's particularly bad for me at the moment. I think the, this is the busiest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, so you know when you're writing two books a year and you've also got the added TV show as well and that everything that attends that it's always difficult yes it is well you survived the book and life podcast yeah. well that's great I've thoroughly enjoyed it it's been very good thank you well, I'm glad you enjoyed it because that's what we try and do here is, is make it the most pain free media a half hour to an hour usually that anyone can go through because I know <laughs> doing media myself, usually by the end of the day, I've asked, been asked the same question 50 times. I want to pull my hair out and I just want to go climb into the nearest pot of coffee and just forget my day's troubles. So, um, so yeah, I try and make this as, as much fun as humanly possible. But yeah, we'll definitely have to have you back so you can talk about your next book that's coming out and to update us on how the show is going and to talk to everyone about that and maybe give them some, some more writers advice on navigating this very bizarre world that we're living in at the moment absolutely but thank you so much for coming on guys we've got an incredible guest next week as well we got super lucky with the poll of people coming on this year so you do not want to miss it and uh, everyone stay safe and try not to hurt yourself out there in this uh, ever-changing world so just give it a minute and then 